We are uh, continuing on uh, with our series of going through themes in the Bible. So we're going to be looking at the theme of creation. So the first chapter of the Bible is one of the most debated, contested, argued about uh, chapters in the Bible among Christians. There are lots of ideas about uh, the story and disagreements about the story and uh, creation of, of creation in chapter one, but most of those arguments really kind of miss the whole point of chapter one. They center largely around how do we interpret the word days in chapter one? Are they literal 24 hour days or are they something else? But that's not the point of chapter one. It's not even close to the most important thing in the chapter. Uh, if the literalist, literalness of those days was important, it's kind of odd that it basically is never mentioned again in the entire Bible. The closest it comes is uh, when God is instituting the Sabbath, he talks about the six days of work and the day of rest, like in the creation week, which seems to support the idea that it's literal, except that there's also a Sabbath year. So there's six years of farming and then a year the seventh year when the ground is allowed to rest. So you can get into debates on that, but that's it. Other than that, that one connection, it's never again mentioned in the Bible because that's not the point. That's not the important thing. So if the creation days weren't the focus of Genesis one, then what was the focus? Well, just like the rest of the Bible, the focus is on God himself. First and foremost, everything in, about, everything in the Bible is about God. And we can see that in chapter one, because while there are the six days of creation, the day of rest, God himself is named 32 times. The name of God appears 32 times in chapter one. Clearly a big emphasis there. Uh, the Bible focuses on God, but what about God? Uh, the Bible focuses on who God is and God's relationship with us, who we are in relation to God. So the story of creation in Genesis 1 culminates with that creation of mankind. <clears throat> and then Genesis 2 carries us on and delves deeper into telling us how and why God made us for a relationship with him. As it turns out, when you understand Genesis 1 in this way, then it actually fits in perfectly with the rest of the Bible. Because the Bible is all about who God is and who we are in relation to God. So it's not about the days. It's about God and our relationship with him. If you think of it in that way, you're not arguing about something that has no bearing on the rest of the story. It is the rest of the story. The whole story of the Bible is about God and our relationship with him. And creation is a central theme in that. The Bible literally begins and ends with creation. So that's number one there. The Bible begins and ends with creation. So first, God created a good world, but we sinned and corrupted that world. And we can see that in Genesis chapter 1. God is the creator. We've talked about this in the past, that the word God in chapter 1 is Elohim, which is not just a word for God. It is a word for any ruler or king. It's used throughout the Old Testament for a various, various earthly rulers, kings, and stuff like that. It means to be in control, to be sovereign. Now, of course, in Genesis chapter 1, it's telling us that God is the sovereign, the king over everything, because he created everything from nothing. And he made mankind, too. So when he created the six days of creation, it says it's good until the very end. Day six, God creates mankind. Then he says it's very good. So God created good creation and very good when man was created at the end. And then he blessed man. And he commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. And he gave them dominion or authority over the earth, gave them the command to go out and to cultivate the earth, to improve it. We've talked about that. You know, you don't have to be a farmer to cultivate the earth. You can be an engineer. You can be a doctor. You can be anything. You're taking creation and you're improving it in some way. You're making it better for humankind to flourish. So that's all part of our creation mandate. We're making the world better, improving it. So that's chapter one. That's our command at the end there. Then it goes into chapter two. And the first three verses are really part of chapter one. You know, remember the, the chapter numbers and verse numbers aren't original in the Bible. They were added later. Uh, but 
the first three verses of chapter two tell us on the seventh day, God rested. So it's just a continuation. But then we get to chapter, or chapter two, verse four, and there's a big transition in the story. Instead of just being God, now throughout chapter two, it talks about the Lord God. And Lord, when you have all capital letters there in your English Bible, it's telling you it's the, the proper name of God that he gave to the Hebrew people, Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, so it's the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. So it's telling us that, yes, he is the creator God. He is the king. But he's the king, the creator, who formed a relationship, created a relationship with mankind through the, the Hebrew people, the chosen people, and he gave them his personal name. So it's all about that relationship. And so Genesis 2 tells the story in a slightly different way. Instead of focusing on the kingship of God and God's sovereignty over creation, creating from nothing, things like that, it focuses on God's intimate creation of mankind, making the man and the woman and having a relationship with them. And when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, it's important to understand how this is progressing. Because sometimes you might hear somebody argue that Genesis 1 and 2 are two totally different creation stories. Uh, there's even this view in liberal academic uh, religious studies scholarship that uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 were written by two different people. And that when they were compiling the Bible at some point, they just took these two creation stories and they're like, they're both cool. Just stick them both in there. But that's not at all what happened. God is telling us about himself through Moses, the one writer who wrote all this, and just giving us two perspectives. One is the perspective of him as the creator, Elohim, and one a little bit different, but just focusing on the aspect of him as the creator of that relationship, that personal covenant he gave us. So the stories might not seem to match up at first, but once you understand it that way, they actually go together quite well. <clears throat> they fit perfectly in with the entire Bible. So. Genesis 1, again, told us that God made man as part of creation, and it told us that he's the sovereign ruler and that he gave us authority under him over the earth. And Genesis 2 tells us why he did that. He made man and woman to have a unique relationship with him. And then we get into Genesis chapter 3, continues on this story. So Genesis 1 and 2 show this great thing. God created man and woman, had a relationship with them, gave them the, the garden, everything is cool. But then Genesis 3, we find out what goes wrong. Adam and Eve sin. So God puts them in this garden. They're perfectly taken care of. They have a relationship with God. God walks among them and talks to them. Uh, but there's two trees in the garden. There's the tree of life, and there's the tree of the, gar of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, you cannot eat from this one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, Satan comes and tempts Eve and then Adam, and they sin, and they're cursed. They bring death into the world, and they've corrupted the world that God had made. And that's the situation we were all born into. We are sinners. We reject God. God gives us commands. We say, I know what God said, but I'm going to do this instead and we are sinners. Now, God could have left us in that, but he didn't. And that's the story of the gospel, hopefully, that you are quite aware of, that Jesus came, lived that perfect life that we chose not to, died in our place. He took that sin upon himself. But so that's chapter three, foreshadowing into, even with uh, the, the promise, while God gives the curse, he promises that one of Eve's descendants would defeat sin and death for us. Now that's the beginning, the opening of the Bible. God created a good and perfect world. We corrupted it through sin. So we see that God created this world. We corrupted it. We brought a curse into the world. And Romans 8 actually tells us that the entire creation groans out for redemption. So we corrupted everything, all of creation. That's why we have sin and death and disease and all sorts of evil in the world. And the rest of the Bible is going to focus on the story of God fixing that situation. The whole story of the Bible is God taking that initial situation, that problem, and solving it, putting in motion his plan of redemption. And then that leads to be there. God will create a new heaven and earth. 
So the beginning of the Bible, chapters 1 through 3, we just talked about. Now we can look at the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21 and 22. In Revelation 21, it tells us this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. So the Bible begins with the story of creation and ends with the story of a new creation. The Bible begins in the garden and ends in the city. The Bible began with God being with his people in that garden and ends with God with his people in this city. But there's even more than that. If we look at the next chapter, the very last chapter of the Bible, chapter 22, verses 1 through 3 say this, Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there will be no longer any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. So besides being in the city of God, with God, we're also going to have the tree of life, that tree from the garden, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Genesis. That tree is back there. That tree that we were cut off from, that tree of eternal life we were cut off from because of the curse is going to be there in heaven, in the new city, in the new Jerusalem with us. It's a perfect and complete restoration of what we lost at the beginning. It's a culmination of everything. And it's better than a mere restoration. We're not merely back in the garden where we're banned from that one tree. Because in Genesis chapter 2, God said, there's one tree you can't eat from. We're not there anymore. We're back there. We have free access to everything. As the prayer this morning from John said, that inheritance that we have through Christ. We inherit all things. In Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter of the Bible, mankind was commanded to be fruitful and multiply. And we see here in Revelation 22, the very last chapter of the Bible, the nations are going to be there in heaven. It says that the tree is for the healing of the nations. Well, what do the nations represent? The fulfillment of the command to go out and fill the earth, to multiply. And we fill the earth with all these peoples, all these groups, all these peoples from around the world are going to be there in heaven, united, worshiping Jesus together. So it is, again, the culmination of the entire story of the Bible, going back to that very beginning right there. So when we think about this, what we see is that the story of the Bible from beginning to end is a story of God's relationship with mankind. God forming people, having a relationship with them, being their Lord and being their king, but man rejecting him, sinning, being cut off from him. But the rest of the story of the Bible is God restoring that relationship until finally, in the end, it is perfectly restored and we are back with Jesus again, back with God, all because of the work of Jesus, because what he did on earth by coming down, living that perfect life for us, taking upon himself our sin. And that's the story of the Bible. And the story of creation fits perfectly in with that. It is an integral part of that. You can't take that out of the story of salvation. It is essential. And then we get to point two there. Uh, it's important to know that God is with us. He is not a clockmaker. Now, you might have heard this idea of God as a clockmaker before. It was really big in like the 1700s, 1800s, and deism. This idea that God created the earth, but then stepped back and is no longer involved. Like a clockmaker who builds a clock. And once he's done building it, he doesn't have to touch it anymore. The clock goes and does its thing. But God is not that way. God is not somebody who created the earth and has stepped back from it. In fact, A there, God's act of creation is both complete and ongoing. So if we look at Colossians 1, it says of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth. 
the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. So it tells us there that God, Jesus, Jesus the Son, God, created everything. Not only did he create everything, but there in verse 17, by him all things hold together. He didn't just create them and leave them, but he actively continues to sustain or hold them together. And we can see that again in Hebrews 1. It says of Jesus, Hebrews 1 verse 3, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So again, he sustains things. He created and holds things together. He is actively involved right now. Now, we can get into physics and talk about you know, how atoms are held together and how molecules are held together through weak forces and all that kind of stuff. But that exists and continues to exist because Jesus continues to make it exist. Jesus continues to hold everything together. We can look at Psalm 104. Now, Psalm 104 is 35 verses, I think. Uh, we're just going to look at a few of them, uh, but you should go back later and read Psalm 104. It's a great psalm about creation, but if we look at just a few select parts of it as examples, verses 5 and 6, he established the earth on its foundations. It will never be shaken. You covered it with the deep as if it were a garment. And in verse 10, he causes the springs to gush into the valleys. They flow between the mountains. So we have before that in 5 and 6, established and covered, past tense. But then in verse 10, he causes, is present tense. He causes the springs to gush into the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They supply water for every wild beast. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky live beside the springs. They make their voices heard among the foliage. And then in verse 13, he waters the mountains from his palace. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of your labor. So we have this mix of past tense and present tense in creation. And if we look at verse 19 and 20, he made the moon to mark the festivals. The sun knows where, when to set. You bring darkness and it becomes night when all the forest animals stir. So he made the moon, he made the sun, but he continues to make night fall each day. So we have throughout the psalm of creation, Psalm 104 is all about creation and God's role in creation. There's this mixing of past tense and present tense because God is actively working in creation right now. He still makes the world function. He's still sustaining the world. He isn't a clockmaker who built it and stepped back, but he is actively, personally involved in creation right now. And then be there. God walked with, lived among, became one of, and lives in his people. So as we follow the Bible through, the story of the Bible, first God walked in the garden with his people. In Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis chapter 3, he's in the garden walking with them and talking with them. Then when we get to the Exodus story, he's living among them in a pillar of fire leading them through. And they have the tent of meeting or the tabernacle which becomes the temple, and he lives in that temple. That's the presence of God with his people there, living among his people. Then, when we get to the New Testament, Jesus, God, becomes a human. He becomes one of us. He is incarnate. He comes down in a physical body and lives as one of us. And then finally, Jesus returns to heaven after the resurrection, and he sends the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit who lives in us. So we see this progression through the Bible, that God walked among the people, lived among them, became one of the people, and now lives in us as the Holy Spirit. So what can we learn from this? Well, one thing is because God is active, God is personally involved, God is living in us as Christians, we can trust God. He is right now in control and actively involved in our lives. He's not somebody who's off to lunch. You know? He's not someone who's disengaged. He is personally involved in our lives and we can trust him because he is the, the sovereign ruler, but he has a relationship with us. We can trust him through uncertain political times. We can 
trust him through uncertain academic times, you know, when things aren't going well in school. I'm sure some of you have had those challenges. You know? Maybe you came to, to college thinking you were gonna ace the thing, everything was gonna go well, you were gonna graduate first in class and you know, all this stuff, but then you hit calc two <laughs> and you know, or structures or whatever, fluid dynamics. I don't know what it was, but there might've been a time when you thought, oh no, okay? Some students don't make it through the program. You know, they have to change majors or go to a different school or whatever. But through all of that, God is in control. God has not abandoned you. You can trust God is in control. God loves you. God is working in your life to fulfill his purposes for your life. <clears throat> when life doesn't turn out the way you want throughout your life, not just in school. I mean, sometimes people get married and things seem amazing and they're going to have kids, but then they have a kid with a disability and life turns out very different than what they expected. But God's in control of that too. No matter what is going on, God is in control. God is actively involved in our lives and we can trust him. And that leads to number three, God creates a people for himself. So God created and recreated his people. So we already looked at Genesis 1 and 2 and God creating mankind. Now we can look forward a little bit uh, to the theme of creation in terms of the flood. In Genesis 9, 1 through 5, after the flood, it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. See that? A creation mandate brought back. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth. Every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish on the sea, they are placed under your authority. So that creation mandate again. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I have given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it, and I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. So we have this creation mandate, this recreation here, as he's starting over with mankind. He's using some of the same terminology. And the theme of creation appears again when God rescues his people from Egypt in the Exodus. If we look at Exodus 15, 17 to 18, it says, you bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your possession. Lord, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. The Lord will reign forever and ever. So that God creating, bringing in, planting, preparing, establishing. Those are creation words. God is creating a people out of the Exodus, pulling them out of slavery in Egypt and creating a new people. And then again, when God rescues his people from slavery in Babylon, I feel like Isaiah 41, verses 19 and 20. I will plant cedar, acacia, myrtle, and olive trees in the wilderness. I will put juniper, elm, and cypress trees together in the desert so that they all may see and know, consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. So again, this idea that God is going to pull his people out of Babylon and create his people. Just as a gardener would plant trees, he is going to create his people and everyone will know that the Lord God has done this. And then finally in the New Testament, God creates the church. And 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we have been called together and created as a people for God, this nation of God, this people of God, this priesthood of God. He has created us. And he has done that as a people, made us as Christians, the church, the people of God. But every one of us individually, he has also made a new creation. If we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. God took your old self and crucified it with Christ and made you a new creation. And that was the promise throughout the whole Bible, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, 
when God promised that one of Eve's descendants would defeat Satan, defeat sin and death for us. And we can see that in Psalm 51.10. The psalmist crying out to God, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Because that ultimately is our only hope, is that God does this work in us. That is our hope for salvation. Our hope for that inheritance that we have been guaranteed and promised is entirely because God has done something in us. He has created a new heart in us. He has taken out our heart of stone and replaced it with the heart of flesh. He has done this work in us. As a church, we've been brought together into this local gathering. God made this church. God's spirit is active in this church. We talked about that with God the Spirit recently. God has done that, and he actively is involved in our church every time we are together. But each one of us is a sinner. But yet we're not identified by our sin. We're identified as our relationship with Christ, as children of God, as adopted into the family. We are identified with Christ because he took our sin upon himself and gave us instead his righteousness. There's a fancy theological term for that called double imputation. The double part. Two things happened. One, Jesus took our sins upon himself. And two, Jesus gave us his righteousness. He didn't just take us, our sins away and leave us. He didn't just give us righteousness on top of our sins. He did these two things together. He took away our sins on himself and died in our place. And took his righteousness that he had earned through his good deeds, through his perfection, and he gave them to us. So that in the eyes of God, if we trust in Jesus, we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, then we are seen as righteous, not as sinners. Even though we still sin, we are not identified as sinners. So we're in the process of being sanctified. We're not perfect yet. We're in the process of growing to be more like Christ. But yet, we're also guaranteed that one day we will be fully sanctified in heaven. Finally, we will be made new creations in heaven with new bodies, uncorrupted. But yet at the same time, we are currently new creations. So it's already and not yet. Already we are guaranteed. Already we are forgiven. Already we have inherited but yet we're waiting for the fulfillment of that inheritance at the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And we have a role to play in this process with each other as a church. We can make disciples of each other. Some of you today got your books that you're going to read together. You are going to be playing a part in the discipleship of each other, in the sanctification of each other, helping each other grow in your faith, in your knowledge, in your trust of what Jesus has done for you. And the Holy Spirit is going to be working in this action to help you grow through studying the Word and studying who God is. We have this unique opportunity as a church to work together and look forward to and encourage each other in the process of growing to be more like Jesus as he creates us new, because he has created us new. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the creation that you have made, this good world that you have put us in, that you have blessed us with, that you have given us dominion over, that you created this world and created mankind to have a relationship with you, that you chose to, to form us and to allow us to know you personally, not just as God, but as the Lord God, the Lord who loves us and cherishes us. But we also confess that we sinned, each one of us have sinned, rejected you, rebelled against you, tried to make ourselves kings. But we know that Jesus died in our place. He took upon himself our sins. And we trust in him alone for our salvation so that one day we can enter the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, and worship him forever, along with people from all over the world, from all the nations, people you have chosen, people you have saved, 
people you have united together into the church. Father, we thank you for not being a, a distant God, You're not being a God who sleeps, being a God who is actively engaged in every aspect of everything happening all the time. And so we can trust you because you live in us by your spirit. You have given us the spirit as a guarantee, as a deposit, as a, a seal in our lives for what we have to look forward to. And we know that we can trust you. We thank you for not only saving us, but making us part of a church that we can encourage one another and be encouraged by one another and that we can grow together and that collectively as a church and as individuals, we can reach out to the world around us and share your good news so that more people from the nations will come to know you so that the fullness of the number that you have chosen from the beginning of the time will come into your church and be with you in heaven forever. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.